thankful to God for this great privilege that he's given us once again to come to the house and worship and praise our great God. I was so touched by our series, Reasons to Rejoice. There was a passage of scripture or the word that inspired me that just kept on my heart. And I was led I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? And who by you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe Do not worry then, saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear for clothing. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble. If you were to just be for real and take an inventory over your life, what are the things that cause you to worry? If you think back and, and look, and, and, and some of us don't have to look so far behind and so far back, but what is it that caused you to worry? Could it be a relationship issue? Could it be a financial issue? Could it be a social issue? My brothers and sisters, if we'll be honest with each other, all of us have worried and somebody today under the sound of my voice may be worried. I, the last couple of weeks I've been watching the news and people are worried about whether there was going to be a red wave or no wave at all. I woke up this morning and heard on the news that uh, cryptocurrency had this huge billion dollar loss. I've also been watching and, and keeping up with so many things about Twitter may go bankrupt and God forbid if we lose Twitter. Some of us worry about things, and the question is, why? Why do we worry? You know, worrying causes a bunch of emotions. 
implications with our body. High blood pressure and other issues, sleepless nights, can result of worry. So I'm, I'm praying this morning that we would open up to what God has to say to our hearts and we could not worry, but seek first his kingdom. Well, you might be saying, Brother Mark, that's so easy to say, but it may be more difficult to do. And I certainly acknowledge that. And in this passage of scripture, God is reminding us and commanding us, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, worrying is a means of being choked or strangled, and sometimes work, worry can do that to us. Worry can strangle us, choke us to where it just dominates our thoughts, dominates everything on our minds. I don't know about you, but I've had some issues in my life that it just dominated my life. But here, Jesus simply says to a crowd that's been assembled, don't worry. And then he goes on in our text to give us the reason that we should not worry. First of all, my brothers and sisters, for those of you who have read Better Bible, you'll see that this, this passage of Scripture is in all red, which means Jesus is talking. These are the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and he opens up the text and he is reminding us, and he says, I say to you, do not be worried. Jesus, the Lord and Savior, says, don't worry about it. It's a command that he's given. And one of the things as Christians is we need to be obedient followers of his word. I really could end the sermon right now, couldn't I? Some of you are saying, I wish you would. <laughs> but the fact that Jesus himself told us to do it should be enough for us to say, okay, I'm going to be an obedient servant. I'm not going to worry. But because he knows our hearts, he knows our minds, he says, let me give you just a few more reasons why. First, of the, and the next thing he tells us in our text is he reminds them that, look, I take care of nature. I take care of birds. I take care of flowers. I take care of these things in nature. And then he goes on to tell us, not only does he take care of those things, but that he loves and cares for us. You see, my brothers and sisters, have you ever thought about the fact that what we worry about, the things that we are really concerned about, Jesus is reminding you, listen, why are you worried about those kind of things? I take care of nature. This general, this general revelation of the earth and all of the things in the earth reveal to you that I'm a loving, caring, and providing God. But if that's not enough, special revelation, let me tell you, out of my mouth, I care for you. And I care for you more than the flowers and the birds. It is nice to know that the love cares and loves us. Romans 1 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made so that they are not without excuse. Just look at nature and God's beautiful portraits of pure mercy and creation. It ought to remind us that there is a God. Now, I can remember going to New Mexico to look at the beautiful mountains, and Deborah and I would wake up, and we would just open up the doors, and we would watch the sun come up over a mountain. And we would just sit there in awe, drinking coffee, and say, how can a person? not know that there was a God. But my brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded that God loves us more than flowers and birds of the field. And then he reminds us of another reason that we should not worry. He tells us in verse 27, worry does not change things or people. You worrying doesn't make a difference. You worry about your finances, you worry about those relationships, all about the Bible, he's reminded us those things won't make a difference. Worrying will not bring about a change for worrying. It's right there in verse 27. He said, what good does it do to worry if 
doesn't change a thing. I can worry about a budget most of the time. But it doesn't do us any good if it's essential for us. And then he goes on later on in verse 30, and we're reminded what we worry about is a lack of faith. If God says to us, and he says, I'm going to take care of you, I will provide for you, I will give for you, I love you, I care for you. What are you worried about? Why are you worried about those things? I love you, I care for you, I'm a great provider. How many of you could raise your hand and give testimony to the fact that says, yes, he's a great provider? Oh yeah, I've been sick before, but now I'm well. I can tell you he's a great doctor. Oh yeah, my brothers and sisters, there are things in life that we need to be able to look at things in our lives and say, That make a difference to us. Doesn't change anything that is there. And then he goes on to say, it's a lack of faith. Don't you trust me? You haven't we trusted the Lord and said, Lord, I trust you in all things. So when you're going through something, do you think it's a surprise to God? Do you think it's a something that didn't just pop up that he knew? No, my brothers and sisters. God knows is coming our way. And we ought to have faith and say, I don't know what it is that you're going through, but know this. God is saying, have faith in me that I'm with you. Know this that I, you can have faith in knowing that it's what's end up going to be what's best for you. You may not understand it now. Have you ever worried about something and then seen that the end come and you look back and say, why in the world was I worried about that? Yeah, I worried about stuff that hadn't even happened yet. Not y'all. Not y'all, but I had. I worry about stuff thinking about what might happen and worry about it. God has said, why would you do that? And then, my brothers and sisters, listen. If we're going to be a peculiar people, if we're going to be a royal priesthood, shouldn't we be different than the world? Right there, he tells us our faith should separate us from the people of the world. Our faith in God should make a difference in how we handle the things that are going on in our life. The people who don't know God worry. But we who know God are in a relation with him, we're his child. Shouldn't we handle things differently? Shouldn't we be different than the world? In the world, in the people of the world, and how they handle situations, yes, we should be able to boldly go into a situation and say, I don't understand why it's happening, but here's what I do know God is with me, and it's going to end up for the fulfillment of His purpose. Ah, uh, uh, we should be living witnesses of our faith so that when things come our way, we are able to stand up boldly and be a witness to those who are lost. And people will ask me sometimes, and, and, and my job, uh, Lord, has mercy. There's two, there's two things that get attached to me. Two kinds of claims that get attached to me. I pray constantly. And when things happen, you know what I do? I just say, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to get Stand before you today that our God will not leave us nor will he forsake us. And then he says to us, don't worry, but then he says, but let me give you a solution. I told you why you should not, but let me tell you why. He said, because I am the solution of all of your issues. He said, don't worry, seek his kingdom. Seeking is a personal and continual action for each one of us. Seeking personally and continually. Someone cannot seek God for you. Seeking is not about being uh, or not being about saved because you did not seek God. God was seeking you. He 
see my brother and my sister, when I was lost and I got saved, I was so excited. And you know what I used to say all the time? I tell people, oh, I found the Lord. No, no. The Lord found me. And you know how, you know what happens? If we just go back to the very beginning of Genesis in the first chapter, we find out that a beautiful world was created for us. Everything was set up perfect by God. And who messed it up? Amen. We did. Adam and Eve messed it up. Sin. Disobeyed. But when God came back, who did the seeking? Was it Adam and Eve who, who sought out God and said, God, I've sinned and, and, and please forgive me? No, no, not so. They hid. It was God who came to them. And from Genesis to Revelation is the story of a loving God reaching out to fallen sinners to trust in his Savior. From the beginning to the end. Then here in our text when he says seek these things, the kingdom, what does that mean? It means that once we're saved, there should be a difference in our lives. First John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. You know what was so amazing about me when I, well, about, about, what, what I was so amazed about was how God could love me so much. And because of his love that he experienced to me, that's why when people say and do things, I love them in spite of what they say. Because that's the love God gave to me. Unconditional love. And that's what we should have for each other. We should have that kind of love. And then he goes on in Luke 19 and 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's constantly seeking and knocking on our door. And we just have to be there to answer. And once we answer, my brothers and sisters, seeking requires effort. This is the passage that we talked about in, that, in Philippians in that fourth chapter. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Yes, it requires an effort. That means that we go to the Lord seeking Him for guidance, seeking Him for information. Isaiah 55 6 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found, call on Him while He is near. You see, my brothers and sisters, when we are those things are happening in our life, we ought to get down on our hands and knees and pray and know that God is there to answer our prayer and seek Him and say, Lord, you know what I'm going through. Give me strength and courage to stand up. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. All your heart. And you know, we need to get to the point in our lives and our prayer lives where we can. Because God already knows our heart. He already knows our need. With all your heart. And then, my brothers and sisters, this seeking requires us to have a prayer heart. And I hope that each one of you are in communion with our great God every day. And I hope that as your day goes by, you find opportunities to pray for me and to read his word. When I was reading this passage of scripture that today, I was so confident. And it just jumped out at me. Here are the reasons not to do it. Here are the reasons not to do it. You see, my brothers and sisters, every time I read and study the word of God and I hear God's voice, it's comforting me. And not only is it comforting me, but it's strengthening me. I've been going to the fitness center, working out in the morning because the pool got too cold. And so I was going back there doing Oh, 
get to the point where I can know what that point is. My brothers and sisters, wherever you are in your Christian walk, start there and pray. And after four weeks, hey, I move my peg down to Rogers. My brothers and sisters, can I tell you there's something better than you? No. Let me tell you what's better than you. And then, my brothers and sisters, we're reminded. First, God is our God is the main thing for which all things flow. You know, I like to say God is number one, my family is number two, my friends are number three. And I realize, no, God is all. God is everything. You mean to tell me we're not supposed to be good to our family? We're not supposed to be good to our friends? We should not honor our father and our mother? We should not give? We, not, we should not do those? Of course we do. But you know why you do it? Because first, it's God is the priority. And when God is the priority of your life, good gracious alive. And I hope and pray God is the priority of your life. Because if God is the priority of your life, when I mess up, you'll say, oh, forgive me. When God is the priority of your life, you understand the importance of honoring father and mother and your parents. When God is the first priority of your life, you understand it, why you should give and support the ministries of the church. When God is first in priority in your life, you know why you should treat your spouse. Love my wife unconditionally. Because his kingdom first will seek him first and his righteousness. His righteousness. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It was his righteousness that we were justified. It was his His righteousness that we were free from the power of sin. It was His righteousness, His righteousness one day that will free take us from the grave. We must also remember that we share in Him's resurrection. Understand that just. First thing, the first thing you should do is when you come by the dying aisle and say, Oh, I want to come to you. I see you. If you've made that decision already, I hope you go back, read that passage again, and make up your mind to say, I won't worry no more because God loves me again. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so very thankful that you love us, you care for us, you provide for us, and that there will be.